From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. And let me welcome you back to the Cannabis Podcast one more time. Maybe this is your very first time. If it is, then an especially warm welcome for you. We're going to spend some time talking about cannabis and a slightly different context today, and I'll get to that in a moment. But first, let me remind you, this program is intended only for those 19 or older in your jurisdiction and is intended primarily for entertainment and perhaps educational purposes. You should always consume your cannabis responsibly. In episode 139, we're taking a bit of a deviation because I had something occur in my life this last week. You've heard me mention my brother Bill many times in the podcast. He's one of my biggest fans, listen to every single episode. And this episode is, in fact, dedicated to my brother Bill. You may remember from last episode that I asked you to give my brother Bill some good thoughts because he had arrived in the hospital here the day before I recorded the last episode. And unfortunately, he didn't come out of the hospital. My brother passed away on Wednesday of this last week. And... It's been an emotional week. It's been a bit of a struggle. And as you know, the Cannabis Podcast is intended to give you good feelings. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take what's happened this last week with the passing of my brother, and I'm going to turn it around and tell you some stories where you're going to know a whole lot about my brother by the time we're over. And a lot of it is cannabis related, so I'm not taking a complete deviation. And in between some of that, we're also going to drop into a few cannabis stories. And let me tell you what some of those are going to be. In fact, my brother in, uh, and part of his life spent a little bit of time in Amsterdam. So we have a story on the fact that Amsterdam has now opened up. The first regulated cannabis has made its way to Dutch coffee shops. We'll have a story on that. My brother spent a little time in the military as well and was stationed in Ontario. And we have a story from Ontario about <laughs> a town that's still won't allow cannabis retail shops to open up, which I still find is just a little bit strange. And we will take some time for Cultivar Corner because that was one of my brother Bill's favorite parts of the cannabis podcast. And today we're going to be sampling High Quad's Sour Tangy, a very fragrant bouquet. All of that and more on episode 139 of the Cannabis Podcast. So I grew up in a family of four brothers, and my brother Bill was the oldest. He was the one who led the charge, kind of gave us the direction of everything that we were going to go to. One of my most amusing memories was actually with my brother Bill and my brother Don. At the time, we lived in a a corner store called Bill's Grocery in Nelson, B.C. Long gone. It's just a house now. (laughs) And they used to fight a lot at that time. Bill was probably, I don't know, 17, 18, and... Dawn was 15, 16, and and they argued and fought a lot. (laughs) And I still remember my mother chasing them around the kitchen in that store with a broom and chasing them out of the house, beating them to stop fighting. (laughs) And it was probably around that same time or or close to that time where we got a new car. My dad was a, worked at a local uh, car dealership as a mechanic or a, a service manager. And it was, I think, a Dodge Dart. One of those bizarre cars at the time, so this was in the early 60s, and the transmission was push buttons like where the radio push buttons would be. Totally bizarre. And I remember I took a trip with my brother Bill driving. I think my brother Don was there as well. We left from Nelson, and we went down to Deer Park in Spokane. We were going down to see some drag races. (laughs) I was probably six years old at the time. And no big deal in terms of what happened there, except, of course, he did drive a little fast. And when we returned to Nelson, (laughs) I, of course, was supposed to keep quiet about that. And the very first thing that came out of my mouth when we arrived back in Nelson to my dad was, Bill went 100 miles an hour. (laughs) And for some reason, his driving restrictions were, or his driving was restricted after that. (laughs) Of course, he also had a propensity to take vehicles late at night when he wasn't supposed to be. And he tells a story of one time when he did take a car and, and he fu- he finally got caught. <laughs> and when my dad was driving him home after picking him up, he repeatedly punched Bill in the left shoulder and Bill said it hurt like hell. <laughs> and that, in fact, was the shoulder that he eventually, when he 
spent a drunken night at the Hume Hotel in Nelson, got a tattoo on that shoulder, a, a rather bad tattoo of a what was supposed to be an eagle, but it kind of had to be described to you before you could figure out that it was an eagle. <laughs> Bill left home at, I think he was 16, 17, whatever age you have to be to be able to go and join the army, he was. <laughs> and he left high school, took off, and I didn't see him for a long time while he was in basic training, and I think he spent four years in the service. And as part of that, he, he originally started in Oshawa, Ontario, which I think was the first base that he was at. And so that gives me one point to deviate to. Let me hold the stories on Bill, and let's talk about what's happening in Newmarket, Ontario, because it's still kind of bizarre and I can't quite believe it. Newmarket won't budge on banning retail cannabis outlets. Newmarket Council did not budge on its position on disallowing retail cannabis outlets as retailers asked for reconsideration. Retail industry representative Rihanna Ford was a delegate December 11th, asking the town to consider allowing the stores. Current regulations put planning control in the hands of the Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario once a municipality opts in to allow stores. Newmarket Mayor John Taylor said council maintains the position to disallow stores until that changes. He said planning control is needed so that the town could, for example, prevent there from being too many stores on Main Street. This is not an option for us now, and I think it is our continued position we will have to wait for that legislative change, Tater said. Newmarket is one of several communities in the region that disallows retail cannabis stores, including Richmond Hill, Vaughan, and Markham. Other communities, notably neighboring Aurora, have opted in. But Ford and industry representatives are trying to get more municipalities to allow retail cannabis. Ford said the decision came about for three primary reasons, including one directly relating to Newmarket's continued refusal. The provincial government has no intention of providing Mississauga or any municipality greater control over the location of cannabis stores, Ford said. She added that other reasons include the maturation of the markets to avoid overcluttering and the existence of legal retail cannabis can reduce the profitability of the illegal market. She noted Newmarket has its own issues with the illegal market with the opening of Newmarket Smokes Loud a few weeks ago. Ford said cannabis has been legal for years and the community should have the ability to access stores while avoiding a drive of 30 to 40 minutes. And there you go. Why? <laughs> well, I guess it's kind of in the story of why, but I still don't totally understand the rationale behind it of why these municipalities are still not opening cannabis stores. From the Cannabis Infused Studio in the Clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. I realized as I started to think about some of the stories I wanted to tell that I could go on for hours on this, but that's not the intent. I do want to keep the content to about the same length as the episodes usually are. So I'm going to be perhaps a bit more selective than I originally had intended. To understand my brother Bill, there's a critical story that you need to hear. And that relates to him visiting at Christmas. My family had moved to Williams Lake. Bill was still living in the Kootenays. He was a Kootenay boy, died and true. The family moved originally into the Kootenays, into Burton, uh, when Bill was probably about five or six years old. And from that point on, the Kootenays was Bill, and Bill was the Kootenays. They had an incredible connection that never was separated. So that was really a key part of him. So that's where he still resided, and he would come to Williams Lake for Christmas. And this one particular, there's actually a couple of Christmas stories you're going to hear. <laughs> this one Christmas, he was late to come. He was driving up late. It's probably now after 9 o'clock on Christmas Eve. We still haven't seen him. He's on his way driving up the Caribou Highway, and he hasn't done his Christmas shopping yet. <laughs> so he did. <laughs> it was a gas station in Cash Creek, and in that gas station in Cash Creek was where Bill and later our entire family was introduced to the Trim Trio. Now, if you don't know what I'm referring to in the Trim Trio, go ahead and Google it, look it up. <laughs> it's a handy little personal uh, device, uh, personal grooming device, I guess would be the best way to describe it. It has a uh, nail clippers, a nail file, and a nail thing so you can clean your nails. And here's the relevant, really important part about the Trim Trio. It has a screwdriver. And that screwdriver will come to play in probably the last story I'm going to tell you today. So remember about that screwdriver. So that's what we, when Bill finally arrived, 
I think it was after midnight by the time he finally did arrive. Everybody woke up Christmas morning uh, opening the presents, and, and then came the presents from Bill, and it was a little cardboard stock with a trim trio attached to it. <laughs> and that became... It became one of those things, you know how in your in a family, there are those things that you just keep mentioning because they had, they, they started those moments. Well, well, that was one of them. The trim trio was definitely one of those moments. <laughs> and while we're on driving home for Christmas <laughs> and Bill, here we go again. So Bill left behind his daughter, Angela, or Angie, she's known to all of us, and his ex-wife, Joan. Angie? If there's anything you need, just give me a call. Happy to be there for anything you need going forward. You know how much you and your dad mean to me. This story occurs when Joan and Bill were still married, and Angie was three, perhaps, maybe four. Joan, Angie, and Bill drove from Nelson all the way up to Williams Lake. And they were bringing the turkey. Yeah, you probably already know where the story's going, don't you? <laughs> They did bring the turkey on that eight-hour drive from Nelson up to Williams Lake in the middle of the winter with the heater going in the car. And then we cooked that turkey on Christmas Day, and uh, <laughs> one by one, everybody started dropping with food poisoning. <laughs> That's another momentous story that we all remember <laughs> about my brother Bill and the famous Christmas turkey. <laughs> now, when Bill was in the military, he did spend some time in uh, Germany with the forces. And I think it was after that he actually paid a little visit to Amsterdam. And that's a pretty good lead-in to another story that I wanted to cover off today. And that is the fact that, and this is from Stratcan.com, a year after formally announcing plans to explore options for regulating the supply chain for its hundreds of cannabis coffee shops, the initial two locations had begun selling the first legally cultivated cannabis in the Netherlands. The Dutch government announced its plans for the project in 2022, which include exploring the possibility of a closed cannabis chain for cannabis coffee shops in several cities across the country. The goal of the closed-loop experiment is to explore the possibility of quality-controlled cannabis production and distribution system in the country as an alternative to the current tolerance policy that has not legal but tolerated coffee shop style points of sale and unregulated illicit growers who supply them. By regulating the sale of cannabis, we have a better insight into the origin of the products and the quality, Dutch Health Minister Ernst Cooper said recently. In addition, we can better inform consumers about the effects and health risks of cannabis use. The Dutch cities of Breda and Tilburg are home to the first two shops to sell this cannabis. Kilper has joined Breda's mayor Paul Delpa and Tilburg's mayor Theo Wetterings in the coffee shop De Baron in Breda to show off the first delivery of cannabis. Another handful of cities will be participating in the program, with products supplied by 10 different cannabis growers selected to supply cannabis for the project with product quality control and preventative efforts to reduce health risks being implemented. The selected coffee shops are allowed to have a maximum of 500 grams of cannabis from these legal growers at a time. Currently, there are around 565 cannabis shops in the country. The policy that provides for these shops to exist was first introduced in the Netherlands in 1967, allowing adults to buy small amounts of cannabis in designated coffee shops. However, the issue of how to properly regulate the supply of these coffee shops has long simmered in the country over concerns with public safety and law enforcement, especially with many of the commercial growers located in residential areas. In 2009, an advisory committee looking into the issue recommended a small-scale experiment to explore how to regulate coffee shop supply. In 2015, the Association of Dutch Municipalities added to the pressure on the government to regulate these supply chains. This led to the creation of the Coffee Shop Chain Act, which was successfully passed through Parliament in 2020. Since then, the Dutch government has been preparing for the study based on the input of its expert committee, which consisted of experts in public health, addiction, law enforcement, local government, criminology, and law. They held roundtable discussions with stakeholders like mayors, coffee shop owners, cannabis producers, regulators, scientists, cannabis users, and addiction experts. Similar to Canada, the committee's report discusses the challenges of such an experiment and any possible future legalization, which is still in contradiction to existing international laws. 
This is one reason why the government is not seeking to import any cannabis for this trial. Growers selected for the program will be required to pass various microbial and pesticide testing standards and will potentially need to adhere to Good Agricultural Practice, GAP, and Good Manufacturing Practices, GMP. The committee also recommends a soft approach to any recommendations for irradiation or remediation given stakeholder feedback citing consumer distaste for such a designation. Product labels will be required to include warnings, related information, and a THC logo. And products must be sealed in a resealable child-safe container. Selected growers will be required to be registered with the Chamber of Commerce. Growers will also be asked to offer a variety of THC and CBD levels. This is based on samples of cannabis from the country's coffee shops, showing cannabis sold to have an average THC content of about 17%, compared to about 6.9% of THC for samples from illicit imported cannabis. Imported hash had an average THC content of 20% in 2016. In the reports, Dutch-made hash made an average THC content of 35.1% in the same year. Based on this, the committee recommended 15 cannabis varieties and 10 hash varieties should be sufficient for the initial stages of the pilot project. The committee does not recommend including space cakes and other edible cannabis products, citing public safety concerns, especially with accidental ingestion from young people. Interesting the different approaches that are being taken around the world, with, of course, the Netherlands, cannabis still being illegal, but this new experiment to a designated supply for coffee shops? Hmm, I think it's a great idea to try something else. Remember I mentioned that we had a a small cafe and corner store called Bill's Grocery? (laughs) Uh, That's because my dad's name was also Bill. Of course, Bill, my brother, was Bill Jr., It was really funny when we got together with my cousins, who was also named Bill, and the father was also named Bill. So we had Bill, 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 and Bill. (laughs) Actually, we had Bill, Bill, and Bill Jr., and Bill Jr. It got very, very confusing around Christmas time. (laughs) Bill's 21st birthday. Let's say he had already been in the bars a few times. Probably was not his first day in any of the bars in Nelson. (laughs) But on his 21st birthday, he started early. And... He arrived back at the cafe where mom had dinner planned uh, in the cafe portion. We closed the cafe so that we could have a little family uh, dinner in it. The whole table was, the long table was set up and my mom made some fried chicken, delicious fried chicken. And Bill shows up, as I say, already three sheets to the wind from from his travels, stopping at various bars on his 21st birthday. (laughs) I'm sitting at the other end of the table. Now, there's a nine-year age difference between us, so you can do the math, 21 minus nine. <laughs> I'm sitting at the other end of the table. I say, Bill, can you pass me a chicken a drumstick? Well, the bowl's right in front of Bill, and he says, sure. And he starts throwing drumsticks down the other end of the table, which my mother was not too impressed about. <laughs> But it still brings a chuckle to me every single day. I think of his 21st birthday and throwing those. (laughs) On the day that I got married was another really important day for my relationship with my brother Bill. There was a lot of stress, as I'm sure you can appreciate when before a marriage. (laughs) And, you know, everything was, and I I was just getting riled up. Well, Bill took me aside and then said, come on, let's go. He, my brother Don, and I took off in his car, drove a few blocks away, got out of the car, and he pulled out a joint of some Acapulco gold. That was the first time I'd ever tried, and it was true Acapulco gold at that point, just a wonderful smell, wonderful aroma, wonderful taste, and boy, did it get me blasted. <laughs> And that's what got me through the rest of my wedding, (laughs) was that little burst of some Acapulco gold from my brother Bill just before we went back. And and the the ceremony was supposed to be held outside. It rained that day. We were all crammed inside my parents' living room. There wasn't enough room for all of us. That was part of the stress. But that made it a heck of a lot easier for me to get through that day. And this is a story that I think every single one of our children told as we were all reminiscing about Bill this last week. When we had our 25th wedding anniversary, my entire family came to Kelowna and gave us some time off. 
and looked after our kids for, I think, three days when we went to the Lake Okanagan Resort to celebrate it. So they were here for that time, and in that time, Bill took the kids on various adventures in his Jeep, which he had at that time. <laughs> and my kids still tell the story, as they describe it, of climbing up Knox Mountain in his Jeep and then going to this just arbitrary, weird little hill, and Bill kept driving his Jeep up and down and back up and down <laughs> that little hill in the summer, and... As everybody turned around, there was my daughter, Sarah, who was the youngest of the crew, my daughter, Sarah's son, Sean, and Ian. And Sarah's face is just literally covered in creamsicle, which she had been eating all the time they had been driving around in this Jeep. <laughs> and that is a still a story that's told today, I think, by each and every one of my children. And they remember Bill very fondly for that. Another thing that a lot of people remember about Bill is he used to go on long walks, uh, what they called the grind in the New Denver area. I think it was up to the top of Idaho Peak. I might have the mountain wrong. I was never as good at mountain names as he was. <laughs> but he used to grow a lot of cannabis in his place over in the Kootenays. Uh, had some every year. And out of that crop every year, he would make some oil and he would make cookies. And his ginger snap cookies of cannabis were legendary in the Kootenays. And he used to consume them quite regularly himself on his walk up the grind. He had a series of dogs over the years. Harley was one with which many, many years. His current dog was named Rosie. Rosie, unfortunately, has now been... Somebody else has taken Rosie under their wing. I'm sure she's still kind of sad why she can't see Uncle Bill anymore. But that grind was... He used to love those walks and those cannabis-laced cookies were what kept him going. <laughs> he and I smoked a lot of joints together over the years. And there is a story that I told in an earlier episode, and I'll just give you a brief version of it. And that involves when I had the volcano. And Bill had only discovered the volcano soon before this story. Arrived into town, he was with a friend, and he called me up and he said, Gary, Gary, bring the volcano over. And <laughs> so I did. I always did what my brother asked me to. <laughs> Showed up at the motel. They had a bunch of weed with them. Pulled out the volcano, and we proceeded to consume a considerable amount of cannabis in a fairly short period of time. And that's the thing with the volcano. You, If you give it a time to dissipate, it's hard to determine that a volcano has been used in a room. But we were pushing it really, really hard. And then I said, okay, now we've got to stop for a bit. Let's let's leave five minutes before we do anything. And after that five-minute period, uh, one of the people that was there, her, his partner came into the motel. And the guy said, okay, can you smell anything? Do you know what we were doing? And she said, no. Said, we've been smoking weed. <laughs> they were so thrilled and amazed at how the volcano worked in terms of a vaporizer by, by dissipating that smell and aroma very, very quickly. And that was one of my fondest memories of Bill, smoking weed in the volcano. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Go to the corner, go to the corner, oh yeah. Go to the corner, please explain this stuff to me. On Cultivar Corner today, we're dealing with a product from a company that won the AR Cannabis Cup last year. And the company is called High Quads. Just cracked the lid on this three and a half grams of sour tangy. My goodness. <laughs> it is so bold and bountiful in aroma. Mm. And let me pull out one of those buds. I'll tell you a little bit about High Quads in just a moment. But... I want to first of all take a look with my jeweler's loop. Oh my, look at those trichome fields. Mmm. Oh, very nice. Bright green. Nice orange pistols scattered throughout. Really a nice structure on the bud. Nice cure on the bud as well. There's been some care and attention paid to that, obviously. Mm -hmm. And the smell, absolutely amazing. This three and a half gram glass jar from High Quads, THC sitting at 27.5, and the total terps, 
5.58. <laughs> and here, let me give you a little bit about what High Quads is all about. Buying cannabis flower in the legal Canadian recreational market can be a gamble. A lot of trust is put in the brand's story and the people selling it. At High Quads, they look for the best and buy it. Simply put, only the highest quality quads for them and their discerning consumers. Your standards are high, and so are ours. High Quads is a premium source cannabis brand with roots deep in Canada's former legacy market. Our procurement team uses the tried and tested four-point grading system to identify the most high-quality craft flour. Using this system, we seek out unique micro-batches grown at a small scale that go beyond the quadruple rating, four A's, or quads, making it a high quad. And if it's not a high quad, you won't find it in our jars. Expect the highest quality rolls with high quads premium flour. Mmm, and what a bounty. So, let me get to the details on this particular strain. Sour Tangy is what we're talking about, and this is a cross of East Coast Sour Diesel and Tangy. So, that cross will bring together the classic sour diesel aroma with Tangy's strong citrus overtones. Mm -hmm. So, you definitely got the gassy notes from the East Coast Sour Diesel. And then, added on top of that is a nice little layer kind of just sitting right up there. Mm -hmm. Is the tangy, the citrus overtones. Oh, absolutely delightful smell. Love the presentation in the jar. Some care and attention has been paid to these buds. And one thing I noticed... Actually, you've heard me talk about on Cultivar Corner before, how do they get the nugs so nuggy? And, and by that, I mean the denseness. How compact and dense is that bud? And there has been some product of late where it's been really, really dense. I'd love somebody to explain to me how it gets that dense first and foremost. But sometimes it's a little too dense. It's pretty hard to break that up. And as I'm looking at this high quad sour tangy i'm kind of on the other side it is not really really hard it is certainly cured properly and has some some substance but it still has some give still has a little pushback and it's a little sticky as well so really a nice flower got the joint ready i've got my air max from a riser all ready to go to get a taste of the weed from that perspective and let's give it a go sour tangy 27.5 percent thc and terp sitting at 5.58 oh i love this the taste of that that is so smooth mm. oh and here comes my furnace And since I sometimes make reference to my furnace, <laughs> I thought it was time for you to get a sense of what that actually means. Because if you noticed, it's not quite as noisy anymore. <laughs> Back to my challenge at hand. And let's say it's not really a challenge. So I have in my hands the joints of the Sour Tangy from High Quads. Let me relight it up. Nice, smooth smoke, really. I, I enjoy the taste of it. A little bit of that gassiness as it's coming in. And some of those citrus tangy notes on the exhale on that. The Air Max from a riser is all warmed up. Let's see what the herb tastes like. Oh, much more of the gassy notes. Mmm. Oh, and even more of the citrus tones. Oh, wow. This really tastes good. And I have to say, it also seems to be having a fairly good effect. Here's the happy eyes. <laughs> have I ever said, I really like being high? <laughs> Even if my intention was not perhaps clearly established of what I was hoping to accomplish with Cultivar Quarter today, I think the obvious intention is, I just want to see whether this sour tangy is going to get me really buzzed. <laughs> Mission, I believe, accomplished. <laughs> oh, yeah, really enjoying the, the, the smoothness of it. The buds, again, 
really, really nice jar appeal. Just love the, the look of them, the, the bright green, the orange pistols in there, and still squishy. Taste delightful, especially through the vaporizer. This was also a winner of the AR Cannabis Cup last year. High Quads was, not this particular strain, but High Quads themselves. And they appear to be uh, locating and distributing some pretty fine quality cannabis. The folks at High Quads, glad I came across this one, maybe like a little bit more detail about where the weed actually came from. I get the impression that High Quads is collecting from a number of different micros. Well, maybe it's a, it could be the same micro. I don't know. <laughs> but that information isn't obvious. And I also think that because if you look on the jar, uh, it is actually Herbal Dispatch that's listed in Rosebud Productions. And that, again, leads me to believe that this is a collection of we're gathering all this weed from people who really know how to grow really good weed, and we're finding a way to get it to market. And I'm in favor of that kind of activity. <laughs> Ah, this is another Saturday, the start of my weekend. Winter actually arrived here in the Okanagan overnight. There is probably a couple inches of snow out there on the ground today. Well, it means that I'm going to stop riding my bike to work. <laughs> Time to hoof it again. Mm. But if I was smoking some sour tangy, I think I might be able to go out there and do a good job of shoveling that sidewalk. This high is really, really nice. The kind of sativa that I'm looking for on an early morning, feeling that buzz. I definitely got the happy eyes, but my head is clear. It's not foggy. I don't. I don't feel like I'm going to have to sit here and go duh duh duh. <laughs> no, really, really sharp. A lot of clarity. Lots of euphoria. This is really nice. Twenty-seven point five percent THC. Terps at 5.58, those terps again, osamine, terpinaline, and limonene. Mmm, sour tangy from high quads. I am liking the effect. Sharing stories about good weed while trying good weed. This is the Cannabis Podcast. And let me thank you for being a listener. I so appreciate the fact that you were here, especially in this episode. And I also want to thank my supporters, Jordana and Kevin at buymeacoffee.com slash cannabis podcast. If you feel so inclined and you like what you hear, you can go there too and buy me a doobie. Or you can become a patron on Patreon, just like Tony and Roger, Gage and Rob have done. I truly appreciate the support. And let me finish this episode with a couple of final stories about my brother Bill. We lived in Winnipeg at one point which kept us fairly separated from the rest of my family, who almost all lived in B.C. for a lot of their lives. But there was a time when all three of my brothers, my youngest brother Dave, Don, and, of course, brother Bill, came to visit us in Winnipeg. And <laughs> there's two relative stories to that visit that I'm going to finish with today. The first is when my brother Bill held me up to my own standards. <laughs> They had come to visit me. So this was in probably, now we're in the, talking in the 1980s, probably the early 80s. And as should not be a surprise, based on the fact that I'm doing this cannabis podcast, I have been a proponent and a believer in cannabis for many, many years. And that was the case then. And I think I had written a song in the time that I was off work that purported to, you know, rate, I, I wish I could remember it. <laughs> It may be on a piece of tape up in my attic, which my wife discovered this year. I should pull those out and see if I can find it, because it would be very cool if I could. But it was a song about being proud to smoke a joint. Proud to hold that joint high and say, I consume cannabis, I'm happy about it, and I want to do it. Well, I shouldn't have played that song for my brothers. <laughs> that was the first thing I did wrong. I, I let them hear the song. And they took it to heart after that. <laughs> we are heading out doing some shopping. Now, this is Winnipeg long ago. I think where the new arena is in Winnipeg used to be the Eaton store. And that's where we went on our little shopping excursion. We got out of the car in the parkade. And just as we're about to enter the store, my brother Bill pulls out a joint and lights it up. Now, to be fair, 
Whether it was my brother Bill or my brother Don who physically lit up the joint, they were both involved, and they both smoked it as we entered into the store. And I went, whoa, whoa, what are you doing? And he went, what do you mean? Hold it high. Be proud. <laughs> and we proceeded to walk into Eaton's, smoking a joint, in the mid-80s in Winnipeg. <laughs> My heart was just beating like crazy, even though I purported to be, you know, I, I did want to purport legalization, but I thought, I don't want to get busted. <laughs> I convinced him to put it out soon after we got in there. He got the, the, the rush of going through it, pushing my buttons, <laughs> as brothers are wont to do. <laughs> and that brings me to the final story about Bill. It's not cannabis-related, but it's sure bill-related. And it brings us back to that trim trio. I only worked one all-night shift in all of the years that I worked in radio. And that was this particular night, which was December 30th. Can't remember the actual year, sometime in the 80s. So the night before New Year's Eve, my brothers were heading back. They were going to start driving at some point during the night. I think, actually, they started the drive back just after midnight. But they were out with my wife while I was working, doing the all-night shift. They went to a little bar in Winnipeg. It was down in the financial district. And in that bar, it was a piano bar. It had a beautiful grand piano. The one problem with that beautiful grand piano, from my brother's perspective was there was a sheet of plexiglass over that entire grand piano. So, my brother Bill and my brother Don was involved in this as well, while my little brother David, who, by the way, was underage and shouldn't have been in the bar, <laughs> and my wife Jan watched fearfully. They each had a trim trio. So they proceeded to sit at a different seat around that grand piano and loosened all the screws for the plexiglass with those trim trios. And once they had sat down at every seat and loosened every screw, they got on opposite sides of their piano, picked up the plexiglass, took it over and placed it against the wall, and the piano player went crazy because now the piano sounded like a piano. <laughs> But that is a pretty good description of my brother, Bill. <laughs> I love him dearly. I'm going to miss him dearly. We are all going to miss him dearly. And I hope you now have a, have a little bit of a sense of, of who my brother was, what a fun guy he was to be around, how much he liked to smoke and consume his cannabis. And I want to thank you for allowing me to share a little bit of my memories with you. It's helped me through the grieving process. Thanks. Next episode, we are going to have a conversation with Alexandre Poulon. Alexandre is the head of Jubilee, a Quebec edible manufacturer. He uh, has some fascinating stories to tell, and we will share those next episode. Now, in the tradition that we started a few episodes ago, let me finish with a little bit of humor for you. And considering that this episode is being released on Christmas Eve, I think a Christmas connotation has some appropriateness. So what do you call a snowman who smokes cannabis? Frosty the Dube Man. Oh, come on, you chuckled. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. I truly appreciate it. That is it for episode 139 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. Hey friends, I'm Brandon And I'm Saba. And we are your host of the Cannabis Hangout Podcast, an educational platform to connect with the cannabis community and share personal stories while breaking the stigma of marijuana. Join us every Sunday at 7 p.m. to gain valuable insight with different perspectives from industry leaders, growers, and medical marijuana patients. This is a place to learn so much from different angles in the cannabis industry. So tune in while, while we break, break it all down. down.